As far as possible, let us kneel for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift, the blessing of life, the gift of your Sabbath, the protection that you have granted all week. We do not deserve, but we receive it in faith, knowing that you are finishing the work that you have started in our hearts. So please, finish this work of conversion, this work of transformation, that we may be more like Jesus. We thank you for the word. May the word take root in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. May we experience the full power of the gospel. Please give us more of thy Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 11. We're turning in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. And as we're turning, just a short recap for those of you that may, may have missed what we covered last Sabbath. As we examine Daniel 11 and verse 44, how the tidings out of the east and out of the north would trouble the papacy. And in our examination of that, we've come to understand that the king of the north is none other than the Roman Catholic system. Therefore, the king at the head of, the, of that system, being the pope, is the one who would become troubled by these tidings, these glad tidings, the everlasting gospel that would come through the power of the fourth angel's message, which brings to view these prophecies. Now, in our examination, we found that the papacy would become troubled by the fulfillment of dreams, by the fulfillment of prophecy. As these prophecies come to pass, thousands will join the Advent movement, which is a repetition of history as to what took place between the 1830s and 40s when William Miller and Josiah Litch were preaching new prophecies that had never before been preached, but thousands began to join the movement as the fulfillment of Josiah Litch's prophecy came to pass, which he prophesied two years prior to the fulfillment. History always repeats itself. That's what Ecclesiastes 1.9 and Ecclesiastes 3.15 tell us. Now we're picking up in Daniel 11 and verse 45, notice what the Bible says. We're in Daniel 11 and verse 45, the Bible says, and he, speaking of the king of the north, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So speaking of the king of the north, the Bible says that he will plant the tabernacles, that's church, of his palace, that's state, between the seas, that's the nations, that's the people, in the glorious holy mountain. Or it could be translated by stating the mountain of delight of holiness. So we're seeing, again, church and state unite. And history has taught us that the papacy or the Roman Catholic system is a church state entity. When you look at the Vatican, it's recognized as a nation, but it's also recognized as a church. That's the union of what? Church and state. And history has taught us when Christ was upon earth, it was the scribes and the Pharisees, that's the church, who brought Jesus to Herod and Pilate, that's the state, and the two united to do what? To crucify Jesus. When we advance now to our day, history repeats. When we talk about the mark of the beast, it says, as many as would not take the mark of the beast, they would be killed. Revelation 13, verse 15 and 17. Therefore, it will be a union of church and state, the fornication of the church with the state, spiritual fornication, 
this will bring forth the death decree in connection with the mark of the beast, which is coming very soon. But there are some factors here I want to dwell on this morning in light of the glorious holy mountain. We've proved in our previous study that the glorious land cannot be the church. It is none other than America because America has allowed the glorious gospel to flow, has allowed the word of God to flow in this country. Therefore, that is what has made America glorious. And the reason why Christ refers to as the church as being glorious in Ephesians 5 is because in Ephesians 5 we find that the glorious church is made glorious because of the gospel. Without the gospel, the church cannot be glorious. Are you with me? Therefore, as the glorious land is the land of America, the glorious or the glorious holy mountain is talking about God's true church at the end that take a stand for God's law. Notice what the Bible says. Let's examine, let's compare scripture with scripture and allow the Bible to speak and reveal truth to us. Let's go to the book of, let's stay in the book of Daniel. Let's go to Daniel 9. Daniel 9 and verse 16. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 16. Notice how the Bible identifies God's glorious holy mountain. The Bible says in Daniel 9, 16, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem. So notice, God's city is where? Jerusalem. It says, thy holy mountain. So what is God's holy mountain? Jerusalem. But we need to understand which Jerusalem is being spoken of because Revelation 22 and 21 speaks of the new Jerusalem, which is a city. Notice what it goes on to say. Because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. So God here refers to Jerusalem as the holy mountain. As the what? Holy mountain. In order for us to dwell in God's holy mountain, we ourselves must be holy. Amen? And the gospel was given so that we might be made holy. As we give up sin and we give up the things that we love that God's word condemns, the power of the gospel takes hold upon the heart as the individual totally surrenders everything to God. When you read the gospels, the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that it says that the disciples forsook all. They forsook everything. What have you forsaken for God? Not to answer out loud, but for you to consider and ponder upon that thought. What have you forsaken for God? Do you see there's two different Christianities in our world today? One, where you can have Christ, but you don't forsake anything. And another true gospel, where you forsake all and you receive the true Christ. You have a false gospel, you have a true gospel. Which gospel are you subscribed to? Notice what it goes on to say, as we look now at Zechariah. Let's go to Zechariah. We just identified in Daniel 9, 16 that Jerusalem, God's holy mountain, was described as being holy. And God is looking for a holy people. That means a people that are without sin, a people that overcome sin, a people that overcome obstacles and challenges that the enemy might put in their path or temptation that might be in their path as they walk with Christ. So, again, let us look at Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah is about five, is, is the second to last book of the Old Testament. The second to last book of the Old Testament. We have the book of Zechariah. Notice what it says. We're in Zechariah 8 and verse 3. Zechariah Chapter 8, 
and verse 3. Notice what it says. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. So notice here that the Bible says that Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. You, know, you notice that? That Jerusalem is called what? City of truth. A city of truth. So notice here, let's put this on the board. Jerusalem is about truth. Jerusalem, so if we want to go in the new Jerusalem, what must we have a love for? The truth. Notice what the Bible says will happen to us if we do not have a love for the truth. Many people today, they don't want the truth. They rather somebody comfort them and tell them that they're okay, what they're doing is, you know, is not, not bad, and you know, they can just continue living their life. If we don't have a love for the truth, notice what God says. Let's go to the book of Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to come back to dealing with this, this issue of truth and Jerusalem, but we need to look at this. We need to see what God says. If you don't have a love for the truth, that what will happen to you? 2 Thessalonians 2. Notice what it says in verse... Let's start in verse 9. And we're going to read down to verse 12. 2 Thessalonians 2. Thessalonians is right after Colossians and right before Timothy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to get into the NCAA in a moment. We'll get there. We'll, we'll see what's happening with the NCAA. But first, we need to see what God's word says. Notice what it says. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning at verse 9, the Bible says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So here's people that are deceived by unrighteousness because they received not the love of the truth. And notice what it says. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Mercy. So if you don't have a love for the truth, what will God allow to come to your way? A strong delusion that you should believe a what? A lie. The question is, do we love the truth? Do you love the truth? That's the question. Because if you don't have a love for truth, God will allow a lie to come to you to deceive you. It's a serious matter. Verse 12 that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now notice, they didn't believe the truth and they had pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. What is unrighteousness? Does anyone know? What is unrighteousness? I'm sorry? Correct, not believing, that's correct. But, but any, any, other, any other definitions? Correct, that is right. Not having faith in the Lord. Let's, let's make it, a, I'm gonna make it a little more specific. Notice what the Bible says in 1 John chapter five, right before the book of Revelation, you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And 1 John five, and verse 17, 
gives us a very clear understanding of unrighteousness. Notice what it says. It says, all unrighteousness is sin. So what is unrighteousness? Sin. sin. Hmm. And there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So notice that the Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. Well, we need to ask the question, well, what is sin? Let's look at 1 John 3, 4. Same book. 1 John 3, 4 tells us what sin is. Notice what it says. 1 John 3, 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So what is sin? Sin is transgression of the law. Sin, breaking the law, God's law. That's what sin is. Hmm. Let's look at another one. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms 119, 142. Notice what the Bible calls Actually, before we read 142, let's go to 172. Psalms 119, 172. The longest chapter in the Bible is Psalms 119. And notice the instruction that God gives about righteousness in Psalms 119, 172. Notice what it says. Psalms 119 and 172, the Bible says. I still see some pages turning. Still hear pages turning. Psalms 119, 172. The Bible says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So what are God's commandments? All God's commandments are righteousness. So we'll put the law is righteousness. God's law is what? Righteousness. So when we break the law, we're committing what? Unrighteousness. Hmm. Look at the same chapter Verse 176, four verses down. Notice what it says. It says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. So those who are lost sheep, those who have gone astray, are those who do what? They forget the commandments. Now notice it says, forget the commandments. What's the opposite of forget, forgetting? Remember. Remembering. Is there a commandment where God says remember? Yes, there is. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. There is only one verse or one commandment that says remember. There's only one. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8 through 11. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. The Bible says in Exodus 20, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. What's the first word there? Remember, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. To keep it what? Holy. Is, didn't we read earlier that Jerusalem was a holy mountain. And God says that his Sabbath is what? Holy. So if I violate the Sabbath, what does that mean? I'm breaking the law. I'm committing unrighteousness, right? Because the law is righteousness. We read that earlier in Psalms 119. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. 
So how many days has God given us for labor, for work? Six days. Six days. It says in verse 10, but the seventh day, so in contrast to the working six days, God says that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, not your son, nor your daughter, manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, not even your animals are to work. You can't put the, the, the plow on the horse on the Sabbath. Nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Somebody come to visit, you have family come in town. They aren't to be cooking and cleaning and washing clothes on the Sabbath. The electrician needs to come and do some work. Or the landlord wants to come by and do some work. Or the landscaper wants to come and trim the grass. Not on the Sabbath. Not on the Sabbath. You want to tell it. When you're hiring somebody, let them know, hey, you can come anytime, but not after, anytime after, you know, Friday, you don't want to come Friday afternoon or Saturday. If you will schedule somebody to come do some work on your house on a Friday, it needs to be in the morning. And let them know they need to be done by 2 p.m. They need to be done in the afternoon. Because when the sun sets, the Sabbath begins. Notice what it goes on to say. It says, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice that it brings the issue of creation. It reminds us of the beginning, and at the beginning, God worked on six days, and God rested on the seventh day. Aren't we, our, aren't we to be like God? Aren't we to do like God did? And notice here that it says that God blessed the Sabbath day. In other words, there is a blessing in keeping the Sabbath. So what's the opposite? What if I don't keep the Sabbath? What does that mean? Talk to me, Mike. That's right, it's sin, meaning a curse. If we don't honor the Sabbath, there's a blessing in the Sabbath. That's just one scripture. Let's go to another one. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Notice the blessing the Bible speaks of concerning the Sabbath. There's a blessing. How many of you want a blessing? I want a blessing. I don't want a curse. But if we want a blessing, we have to coincide with what God's word says in light of that blessing. Isaiah 56, Isaiah 56, and notice what it says in verse two. Isaiah 56 and verse two, the Bible says, blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath, from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Hmm. So is there a blessing in the Sabbath? No. That's two scriptures. God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Do, based upon Leviticus 23 and verse 32, we know that the Sabbath is from evening to evening, from sunset to sunset is the Sabbath. So from Friday sunset, until Saturday sunset is God's Sabbath. That's God's holy day. That is the Lord's day. Notice what will happen if we honor the Sabbath. Skip down to verse seven. Skip down to verse seven, it says, even them, matter of fact, let's, let's read six. Verse six says, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. Bring where? Holy mountain. You want to be on God's holy mountain? Yes. Then what must we do with the Sabbath? Sabbath? Let's keep reading. Verse 7 says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. 
their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted. In other words, their worship will be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So how do we get to the holy mountain? That mean, in other words, we must keep the whole law. Because the Sabbath is representing the fact that you honor the creator. That's what it means. It's the only commandment that brings to view the creation. In other words, God is reminding us what he did at creation by working six days, resting the seventh day. Why? Because God loves us so much, he wants to spend time with us. He doesn't want you busy working, busy about secular things, busy checking the mail, busy talking to this person about shopping and sales and clothes and all. The, no, not on the Sabbath. Not on the Sabbath. Notice what it says in Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14. Notice what it says. The Bible says in Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14, it says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day. So what is the Lord's day? The Sabbath. The Lord's day is the Sabbath. That's the, that is his holy day. Let's keep reading. In other words, we aren't to do our own pleasures on the Sabbath, is what it's saying. Then it goes on to say, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. So certain conversations we should avoid on the Sabbath. Why? Because it's secular. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with Christ. It has nothing to do with building up your spiritual walk. That means certain people we may want to avoid on the Sabbath. Why? Because they don't keep the Sabbath. Certain people I don't call on the Sabbath. Certain people call me, I don't pick up the phone on the Sabbath. Why? Because what they want to talk about has nothing to do with honoring God. I'll call them back when the sun goes down or I'll call them back on Sunday. Make sense? Notice the blessing that God gives to those who honor the Sabbath. Next verse, verse 14. Notice the blessing. Then shalt thy delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So, notice it says, he will cause you to do what? to ride upon the high places of the earth. What's the highest places of the earth? That's right, it's a mountain. That's right. I want to be on God's holy mountain, Jerusalem. How about you? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. You know, we have to be careful what pastors say, what preachers say, what the Pope says, what family members say, what our husband, spouse, wife, children, cousins, aunts, aunts. We have to be careful what people say. And we have to always come back to the Word of God, and the Word of God must be the authority on everything. The Bible must be the true authority because people can mislead us. But God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that we might not walk in darkness. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. I'll read down to verse 3. Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 1, notice what the Bible says. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Are we living in the last days? Yes, yes we are. 
Notice what it says. In the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. How many nations? All nations. Every tongue, every nation, every people. Verse three, and many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth, what? The law. The law. Hmm. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So as we climb this mountain, what are we going to find? The law of God. The law of God. You know, if you were climbing a mountain physically, it will, and you're not accustomed to climbing mountain, you're not a, accustomed to walking or going up an incline, your body is going to feel the effects of it. It's not an easy task to climb a mountain. And God uses the physical example of that to teach us a spiritual truth. It's not easy keeping the Sabbath on this earth. Everyone else is working against you from keeping the Sabbath in society. Everything in society is not built to honor the Sabbath. No, you have to climb this spiritual mountain as you walk with Christ. Sometimes you're going to have to say, tell family members, I'll talk to you another day. Sometimes you're going to have to tell family members, I can't go to that event on the Sabbath. You're going to have to tell your employer, I can't work on the Sabbath. And there, there may be challenges and obstacles with that. People might not like you. People might not invite you to certain events because of it. But that is a part of taking up our cross and following Jesus. Let's look at another passage. Turn with me in your Bible to Micah. Go to the right. And towards the end of the Old Testament, you have the book of Micah. Micah is about five or six books from the end of the Old Testament. It's about six books from the end of the Old Testament. So if you go to the end, Malachi, and then turn back, you'll come across Micah, which is just after Amos, I'm sorry, Jonah rather, just after Jonah and right before Nahum. We have the book of Micah. Notice what it says in Micah 4. Micah 4, beginning at verse 1, we're reading down to verse 3. Notice what it says. Micah 4, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says. Oh, I still see pages turning. Micah chapter 4. You there? Go to, are you at Malachi? No. What book are you at? No, you're in the wrong, you're in the New Testament. Go back the other way. Other way. Go back the other way. There you go. What book is that? Jeremiah. Okay, go, at, it's after Jeremiah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. It's about five books after Daniel. After Amos, you have Amos, then you got it. All right. So we're in Micah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Micah chapter 4, verse 1 says, But in the last days, when? Now, did we just read one that said last days also? Yes, we did in Isaiah 2. Notice what this says. But in the last, so God is repeating himself. When a parent repeats themselves to their children, what does that mean? It's very important. We must take heed to it. Let's keep reading. But in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain 
of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it, and many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So is there a law in Jerusalem? So if a pastor comes along and says, well, the law was done away, should we believe that pastor? But if the Bible says that keeping the law is righteousness, I should go, I should then keep the law, amen? Now we can't keep it in our own strength, but in Christ, we can obey the law. In Christ, we can be obedient children obeying the law of God, amen? In Christ we can, but not by ourselves. So earlier, we read that keeping the law is righteousness. Let's see what the Bible says concerning the fact. And earlier we also read that those who don't have a love for the truth, God will send them a strong delusion, right? That they should what? Believe a lie. Let's see what the Bible says about the truth. Let's go to... Psalms 119, 142. Psalms 119, 142. Psalms 119, 142. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 142, it says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Is a what? Everlasting righteousness. And thy law is what? Truth. The truth. So if I say I don't need the law, is that the truth or is that a lie? That's a lie. It says the righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. So God's righteousness lasts forever. Well, we read earlier that the law is the truth or the commandments are righteousness. So if the commandments are righteousness, that means the commandments last how long? Forever. Thy law is the truth. Notice what it says in verse 151. Verse 151 of the same chapter. It says, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are what? Are true. These are some amazing scriptures, aren't they, Mike? Very clear, right? Very clear. God's word is amazing. We just have to believe the word. Many people do not believe the word. And we have to be careful of not allowing anyone to lead us astray. Let's turn to Psalms 111 and verse 10. Matter of fact, we'll start in verse 7. Psalms 111, beginning at verse 7, reading down to verse 10. Psalms 111 beginning in verse 7 the bible says the works of his hands are verity and judgment now let's pause who wrote the commandments david no nope. david did not write them moses no nope. moses did not write them god wrote the commandments now think about that who wrote the bible well, God wrote, but God used men to write it, right? Yeah, he, used, yeah. he used men to write the Bible. But when it came to the commandments, 
God says, no, I'm not going to trust man to write them. I'm going to write them. Think about that. Think about that. Hold your finger here. I want you to see from the word of God, not from my mouth, that God wrote the commandments. Let's go to the book of Exodus 31. Exodus 31. Exodus 31 and verse 18. The Bible says God wrote it with his own finger. God trusts man to write the Bible, but God did not trust man to write the law of God, which shows the importance and the everlasting nature of his law that it cannot come to an end because God did it with his hands. We're coming back to Psalms 111, but notice what Exodus 31 verse 18 says. It says, and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So who wrote them? God, God wrote the commandments. But God trusts man to write the Bible. But God did not trust man to write the commandments. Showing the everlasting nature, showing the importance, the solemnity of obeying his law. It's like saying you have a secretary and you tell that secretary, hey, I want you to write this, this, this. But then you have a special letter that you want to write. You say, no, I don't trust my secretary to write it. I'm going to write this letter. I'm going to personally write this with my own hand. Let's come back to Psalms 111 now. Now, as we read Psalms 111 and verse 7, we'll understand the true import of this verse. Notice what it says. Psalms 111 and verse 7, the Bible says, The works of his hands are verity and judgment. What has God done with his hand? Wrote the commandments. Let's keep reading. But what else did he do with his hands? He made man, right? He made man with his hands, right? So that meant he, he, is, he made man to live forever. Not to die. But because of sin, the wages of sin is death. But God made us to live forever as we obey his law. Through the power of Christ. Let's keep reading. It says, the works, verse 7 says, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. So should we doubt the commandments? No. They're sure. Verse 8, they stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So they're done away? No. no. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding, notice this, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. A good understanding have they that do his what? Commandments. Now, earlier in Psalms 119, we read that his commandments are truth. Do you remember that? Yeah. His commandments are truth. Notice what it says about the truth in Psalms 100. Psalms 100 and verse 5. Psalms 100. And matter of fact, I want to read, I want to read the whole chapter. It's only five verses. I want to read the whole chapter because this chapter speaks volumes. It says, make a joyful noise unto the, unto the Lord, all ye lands. Know, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates 
with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. How long does his truth last? So his truth, his truth doesn't change, right? It's forever. You know, you ever hear the saying, oh, we have to change with the times. You ever hear that before? No? I've heard it before. I've heard it. How about you, Mike? You've heard that before? How about you? So notice that God says his truth endureth to all generations. We read earlier in Psalms 119 that the commandments are the truth, that the law is the truth, right? Therefore, the law endures for all generations. The law is truth. That's what we read in Psalms 119, verse 151, as well as Psalms 119, verse 142. Hmm. Why does God want us to keep the commandments? Why? Let's allow the Bible to answer that question. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16. Isaiah 8 and verse 16. Isaiah 8 and verse 16 lets us know why God wants us to keep the commandments. If you write a letter to someone and you put that letter in an envelope, do you leave that letter open or do you leave that envelope open? Or do you close and seal that envelope before you mail it? You close and seal it. So before the letter goes to its destination, you make sure to seal that envelope, right? Are we preparing to go somewhere? Are we preparing to go to the New Jerusalem? God wants to seal us before we go to the New Jerusalem. And that is where his holy mountain is. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 8 and verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Are you a disciple of God? Are you a disciple of Christ? So what does God want to do with you? He wants to seal you before your departure. That's what he wants to do. He wants to seal each of us. And the Bible even tells us where he wants to seal us on our body. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 7. Revelation chapter 7 tells us where God wants to seal his children. Revelation 7. I want to be sealed. How about you? Do you want to be sealed? There's conditions to being sealed. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation 7, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth. So what does this angel have? The seal of God. The seal of God. Verse 3, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Where does God want to seal us? In the forehead. In the forehead. Verse 4, 
And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So how many were sealed? 144,000 were sealed, the Bible says. And God sealed them where? In their foreheads. Hmm. Your forehead is where you make decisions. That's where your conscience lies, your reason, your judgment, where you discern between right and wrong, it's in the forehead. God wants us to make a decision that we are not going to break his law. And that we will have a love for the truth. That we shouldn't receive a delusion. The Bible tells us what that delusion is going to be. You know that? Notice what the Bible says, what that delusion that is coming, that many, that thousands, even millions will be deceived by. Let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13 tells us of the coming delusion. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Verse 13 and 14. Notice what it says. Notice the coming delusion. The Bible says in Revelation 13 and verse 14. I'm sorry, Revelation 13, beginning at verse 13, it says, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So what are we going to see soon? Fire come down from heaven. Verse 14 says, And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. That they should make a what? An image to the beast. How were they deceived? By miracles. What was that miracle? Fire coming down from heaven. Satan is going to seek to impersonate Christ before Jesus returns. And when Satan comes, he's going to touch this earth. Christ will not touch this earth again. Touch, Christ will be on the new heaven and the new earth. The Bible says that those who are dead in Christ will resurrect from the earth and we will meet the Lord in the air, so shall we be ever with the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. Christ won't touch the earth. When Jesus comes back, it's going to be a loud event. The Bible says with the trump of God. Psalms, I believe 50, says that the, when the Lord will come, he will not keep silent. It will be a loud event. It's not gonna be a secret event. Jesus warned in Matthew 24, where he says, if you hear, lo, here is Christ, lo, there is Christ, believe it not. That's what Jesus said. When we consider Revelation 1 and verse 7, the Bible says that when the Lord shall come, every eye shall see him. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 1, 7. Every eye shall see him. And Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 says that when Jesus comes, he's coming with all of his angels. How many? All of his angels. The exact reference for that, you can write down Matthew 24, verse 31 is one reference. In Matthew 25, 31. So again, Matthew 24, 31 and Matthew 25, 31 says that Jesus, when he comes, he's coming with all of his angels. Not some, but all. So
so where does God want to seal us? In our foreheads. Where we make decisions. As we close, let's go to Revelation 14 and verse 1. Let's go to Revelation 14 and verse 1. We're going to get to the NCAA. I didn't forget. Revelation 14 and verse 1. The Bible says in Revelation 14 and verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. So where is Jesus standing? On Mount Zion. On Mount Zion. It says, And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. What do they have in their forehead? Name. The father's name. The father's name. When you look at the name Sabbath. You have the Father's name in the Sabbath, right here, Abba. If you were to do a search, you'll see that the Father is also referred to as Abba. It's right there in the word Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. I believe uh, Romans 14, let me give you the exact reference. Romans 14 refers to as the Father, as Abba. I'm sorry, I don't think it's... No, it's Romans 8. It's not Romans 14. It's Roman 8, Romans 8 and verse 15. Romans 8 and verse 15. You can also write down Mark 14, 36. Mark 14, 36. Jesus referred to the Father as Abba in Mark 14, 36. So when you have Sabbath, you have Abba. The Father's name is in the Sabbath. So God's seal, God's sign is the Sabbath. When we talk about the seal of the living God coming from the east, the seal of God, we're talking about obedience to the Sabbath, obedience to the commandments. This is what the Lord is looking for. Those who will experience this new covenant Christianity, this new covenant Christianity, notice what God says as we close in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. This is what you call New Covenant Christianity. New Covenant Christianity. I want to live under the New Covenant. How about you? Notice what God promises. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Hebrews 8 and verse 10, the Bible says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. Where will God put his law? In our minds. And write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. When we are truly converted, we will seek obedience to God's law. Why? Because God has written them in our minds, and in our hearts. This is the covenant that the Lord is making with his people, even now. Notice what it says in Hebrews 10, verse 16 and 17. Same book. Hebrews 10, verse 16 and 17. The Bible is clear concerning this new covenant Christianity. It says in Hebrews 10, beginning at verse 16, 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Isn't that beautiful? God doesn't remind us of the past. God doesn't bring up what you've done. As long as we confess and forsake sin, there will not be sin next to your name through the power of the gospel. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, that's a conditional promise. That means if you don't confess, there's no forgiveness. But if you do confess, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some unrighteousness, but all he gives you overcoming power not to go back to that sin. Isn't that, one, isn't that a blessing? You know, sin is a weight. Sin is a heavy burden. Sin is not enjoyable. Sin makes people unhappy. Sin brings condemnation. But through Christ, that burden can be lifted. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will do what? Give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That means we have to learn from this book. We have to learn his character. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When you talk about meekness and lowliness, you're talking about a person that is humble. You're talking about humility. Not prideful. Not think that they're important. They're lowly. They're lowly. They're willing to do the lowest task. They don't seek for the most important task. They're willing to do the things that are looked down upon, in a sense, when it comes to the work of the gospel. Whatever they can do for God, they're willing to do. My prayer is that we will experience the converting power of God and have God write his law in our minds and in our hearts and when we allow God to do this, the burden of sin will be removed. Conversion will be experienced. The righteousness of God will be here and here. And we will obey his law. We will negate what people say because our only concern will be to please God. How do we please God? The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God will reward your diligent obedience to his word because that is the demonstration of faith. God will reward your diligent obedience to his word because that is the manifestation of faith. I want to please God, how about you? I want to please God. And God wants us to please him, and God wants to help us please him by obedience to his word. My prayer is that we will each be a part of the 144,000 and be sealed, ready for departure from this earth to the new Jerusalem. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have been so good to us in giving us the bread of life, giving us Christ that we might experience eternal life. Help us to believe your word and to act upon your word. Help us to live by faith is our prayer. We thank you for saving us and for delivering us from sin, for giving us victory over self, victory over sin. We thank you for allowing us to be sealed that we might live in the new 
Jerusalem. You have been so good. May you continue to bless us on this Sabbath. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.